Father, we stand in honor of you. Father, we stand on our legs because you gird us up and are, make us able to do that. John fell on his face as though he were dead until you touched him and raised him up. Father, it is only because of your touch that we're able to stand before you, but out of honor and love and worship and adoration, we stand and praise you and worship you and honor you and plead for you to be with us and show us your face this day for your glory and for our benefit. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Be seated. We're good? We are good. Welcome to you that are here as well as those of you that are joining us um, on live stream. We are glad that you're here. We are uh, <clears throat> starting a new study um, for this next nine weeks um, that I'll embark on here in just a few minutes. And um, it is the study of the Trinity. Uh, we like to, to approach the scripture in kind of easy fashion, you know, make things light and easy, um, cover subjects that are, you know, not too controversial. So we'll tackle the Trinity today. I, I say that in jest because it is deep, but we're going to get there in a minute. I, I would first like to share with you a scripture in Isaiah 55, beginning in verse 6. It says, Seek Adonai, the Lord, while he is available. Call on him while he is still nearby. Let the wicked person abandon his way and the evil person his thoughts. Let him return to Adonai, and he will have mercy on him. Let him return to our God, for he will freely forgive. That was the Old Testament. And Christ fulfilled that for God, bringing that to be because through him we can be saved, we can be forgiven, we can be freely forgiven. Today, as we begin to study this great um, subject of the Trinity, I would like to reference a verse in Luke chapter 3, verses 24, the second part of 21. And when Jesus had also been baptized and was praying, the heavens opened and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. Jesus, in bodily form, is coming up out of the water, having been baptized. The Holy Spirit, in bodily form, in the shape of a dove, descends upon Christ our Lord. And then simultaneously, the voice from heaven, God the Father says, This is my Son, in whom I am well pleased. In God's word, we learn about his law, we will learn about redemption, we learn about some of his characteristics, we learn about Christ's ministry on earth, but today we will begin a study about God himself. Not just what he said, but it is through the word that, he's, that we know this. Not just his character and his attributes, but all of that rolled up into the person of God. Not unlike the word rapture, the word trinity is never seen in scripture. It's never used. The word rapture is never used. We know what the rapture is. We talk about the rapture all the time. Some of us hope for the rapture soon. We certainly all anticipate it. It's a part of the blessed hope that we all look forward to, but it's nowhere can we find the word rapture in the scripture. The same is true of the word, the Trinity. We're going to be studying it over the next nine weeks. I will be discussing the Trinity overall today. The next couple of weeks, I'll be speaking about God the Father. 
The next three weeks, Bob will be speaking about um, God the Son, and the following three weeks after that, Charles will be speaking about God the Holy Spirit. The subject of the Trinity is deep. It's complex. Um, it's not easy. I made just of it earlier. I wasn't making just of God. I was making just of our inability to comprehend such things. But we're going to discuss we're going to study it regardless. Um, it may be a little deeper and more complex than you're used to doing in your study. Um, we've already likened the term um, Trinity like the rapture. Um, so why would we regard this? I mean, a lot of people, they look at the rapture and say, well, you know, it's not in there, so we're going to just kind of ignore it. We don't know when it's going to happen. We don't know exactly how, so we just won't really talk about it. We, we kind of know it's out there, but we're really not going to talk about it. And some of us might treat the word the Trinity the same way. Um, most of us who are wise would say, well, that's a, the, the whole thing of the Trinity is a little incomprehensible, is it not? And that is true to a degree. Some would say um, maybe we shouldn't discuss it. We can't fully understand it, so we shouldn't discuss it. Um, but we are going to... Um, tread in places perhaps angels dare not go, but we will endeavor to do this for this reason. Listen, Dr. Harrell um, said this in an introduction to a course. He said this, Welcome to the study of our triune God. Everything in Christian theology and in the believer's life finally comes back to who God is. The divine nature the persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Holy Trinity is the center of everything. Nothing is more astonishing, more challenging, and more potentially life-transforming than knowing God. God gave us his thoughts. He gave us his ideas. He put these all out there in 66 books that we know as the Bible. God did it that we might know him that we might be able to intimately study him and in that study of his word that we, he might reveal himself to us. God is absolutely God and his choice and plan could have been he is going to remain so remote, so above everybody, so completely unapproachable that we would have no ability to really know who he is. Many of the world's religions today see their God in that way, that he is so so distant, so unapproachable because of how mighty and who he is that they really can't get there. We don't have a God like that. He sent us 66 books so that we might be able to know him. For his people, for his chosen, for his redeemed, his intention was not to remain distant, but to become intimate with his creation with you and with me. The concept and the truth of the Trinity is something most of us have heard all of our lives. Some of us would say, yeah, I get it. I know, I know about the Trinity. It's, you know, God and three persons, and I, I get all of that. We believe in it. We believe it's truth. But the exact how of the Trinity may really escape us a bit. I personally have a built-in go-to for stuff that I don't get. Um, it's God said it, I believe it, that settles it, right? That's my go-to. If you ask me any question that I don't know the answer to, but I know it comes from the Scripture, my answer is going to be, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. That's my go-to. And if I truly can't comprehend something, that's okay. Because God is way above me. So there are things about God and about his plan and about all of those other things that I will never be able to comprehend. My finite mind can't wrap around it. It doesn't mean that everybody's in the same boat as I am, but I'm saying for me, some things I can't comprehend. And it's perfectly acceptable for me to say, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. But sometimes I can use that go-to 
when it's not necessarily something I can't comprehend, it's something I'm not willing to do the work to comprehend. Does that make sense? In other words, I'm a little bit too lazy to dig that deep for it. When something is like, you know, um, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Now listen, that is a deep, 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 deep verse. So I am not making light of it. It is a wonderful verse. It is a life-changing verse. It is a eternal security verse for me. So it's nothing light about it, but I get it. I comprehend it. There are some verses though that are just deeper than that. And I have to dig and I have to go. You know, I thank goodness for Google. I used to have, well, I still have them on my house. Kathy knows. She moves them around for me once in a while. I have concordances and multiple versions and translations of the scripture. And I have commentaries by multiple people. I have um, Bible study books on, on the various books in the Bible. I got all those in my library, and I used to have to get them out, and I, my whole desk would be covered up. Now I have a computer, and I can Google it, and I can do a lot of research a lot more quickly, but it still takes time to research it. Last week, I offered a teaser for this week, and I said this. If Imagine that you are either just about to get married or you've just been married. So you're newlyweds and or you are really approaching as, as um, the betrothed, you're approaching your, your um, day of the wedding. And your spouse-to-be says to you, there's something really unique and special about me. And when you're able to discover and learn what that is, our relationship will be so much deeper and so much more intimate. How would you have responded to that? No, I'm fine just the way we are, right? That's, well, that would probably be the guy. No, you'd be saying, I got to find out what this is. I really need to know, I want to know what this is. And I think that's a little bit what we're talking about here. It, it may not be the best example, but it is an example of what we're talking about with learning about the Trinity, learning about God in three persons, figuring out what that means and how that looks. And He wants us to know. God planted information about himself. He revealed himself in his word. Listen to what he says in Jeremiah 33. Thus says the Lord who made the earth, the Lord who formed it and established it. The Lord is his name. Call to me and I will answer and show you great and unsearchable things that you do not know. Did you just hear God speaking to you? He said this, call to me. Call to me. If you want to know something, you want, man, I have so much to share with you. If you just call on me, come to me, look for me, search me. The song you heard, um, that, uh, that song that you heard the gentleman sing, you know, show me your face. Uh, you know, I, the song, the version that I heard was by a guy by the name of Paul Wilbert. I don't know if he wrote it, but he did it. But he talks about Moses was said, God, sh show me your face. And God said, you can't see my face. And so he hit him in the cleft of a rock and put his hand over his face so that he couldn't see his face. And then he showed him his back. And even at that, when Moses came off of the mountain, his face was shining with Shekinah glory of God just because he saw his back. But then just a week ago, we saw the shepherds coming out of the field and looking into the very face of God in that manger. Jesus was the, uh, Bob's used this multiple times in, his, in Hebrews where he says his, his body was the veil that was torn that we might go into the holy of holies and see who God is. We could never have done that, but 
Now we are made pure. We are made white as snow, according to Isaiah. He has blood has made us white as snow. Even though we were so sinful that we were like scarlet. We were like blood red. But his blood has made us white as snow so we can enter in to that holy place. It said with boldness and grace. What are we there for? We're there to learn of Him. We're there to call on Him so that He can reveal Himself to us. So that he not, He's not the, that God in heaven somewhere way off that we'll never know. But He is, as Jesus, and God with us. Emmanuel. Dr. Tor Horrell, that same gentleman I've quoted before, defines the Trinity in this manner. The one true God eternally exists as three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One in essence, equal in glory, and distinct in relations. There's a doctrine out there called modalism. Uh, and modalism basically says this, that God is one, and what God does is he reveals himself in three different ways, but is still one person, right? Uh, let me use a really inadequate but an example. Um, I'm going fishing today. I'm not. But if I were, I'd go home. I've got a fishing hat I put on because that's what I do when I go fishing. And then tomorrow I may play golf. I'm not. But if I were, I have a golf hat I put on. And then if I'm really feeling kind of um, um, sparky, I, I have a hat that my, I inherited from my dad. And it was one of those like little, what are, I don't know what you call those hats. Pardon? Yeah. Pardon? Go, we call yeah. Go yeah, yeah. So you follow what I'm saying? I'm still the same guy, but it depends on what a hat I'm wearing as to what I'm doing, how I'm revealing myself. One day I'm revealing myself as a fisherman. The next day I'm revealing myself as a golfer. The next day I'm kind of a go faster guy, right? Whatever. I'm just changing hats. That's, that's what modalism says about God. One person, but he reveals himself differently. And I would say to you that I don't think that's what the Trinity means. Dr. Harrell says it is one in essence, equal in glory, and distinct in relations. Oneness, um, Marty could probably teach us, maybe we could let Marty um, get up and teach about this, because he, he came from a church that, you know, there was some of that, not necessarily deeply in it. But that's what oneness is. It says that God is it, the one person God revealed himself as Father, revealed himself as the Son, and revealed himself as the Holy Spirit. But the most important and the most distinct one is the Son. There is a, a pastor out there, Fred Price. I, I'm not trying to bad dog anybody. I, that's not what I'm doing, but I'm just using an example. When he says, when you baptize, you don't baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's redundant. You just baptize in the name of Jesus, that's, and it takes care of all of it. I only have one problem with that. Jesus said, go and baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So it doesn't line up with Scripture in my way of thinking. But do you understand that's that modalism. I mean, you say, well, man, that's just not right. Well, I would encourage you to ponder your own life and maybe even your prayer life. Sometimes we slip into that mode and we don't even realize it ourselves. For example... I could say, Father, I want to thank you for today's food. I ask you to bless it, and thank you for dying for me. Some of you say, well, what's wrong with that prayer? Do you see, I, slipped, I kind of slipped in. It's, I, I, I'm talking to the Father, and the next thing you know, I'm thanking him for dying for me. Well, God the Father, the person of the Trinity, 
was not the one that died for me. It was God the Son that died. You follow what I'm saying? So we can slip into that not really thinking about it. So let's not cast stones at our brothers who perhaps do with that. But I would say to you, in my way of thinking, it is not proper doctrine. It is God in three persons, like holy, 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 right? God in three persons, blessed trinity. How do you see the trinity? You know, a lot of us have grown up and we went through Sunday school and we had, you know, we had um, Sunday school teachers or, or even pastors teach us, well, you know, the trinity's kind of like an egg. You know, there's the shell and then there's the white and then there's the yolk. They're all the egg, but there's different parts. Some of them say, well, it's like water. You know, their water can be ice, water can be vapor, water can be liquid. It's all, it's all water, but it's the different form that it takes. Or three-leaf clover. How many of you have heard that one? It's like a three-leaf clover. You know, there's three leaves on the clover. It's all one clover, right? It is one branch for the clover, but it expresses itself in three leaves. All of those are type of modalism, if you will. Um, would you put the diagram up, please? I hope you can see this. Uh, this is the best that I could find. God is not the Son. God is not the Spirit, but God is God. Father is, Father is not the Son. Father is not the Spirit, but Father is God. Son is not the Father. Son is not the Spirit, but the Son is God. So we'll just kind of leave that up as we continue on. One of the great tensions that is inside of this entire concept of the Trinity is monotheism versus polytheism. And what that means is the belief that God is a one God, there's only one God, and then the, the, the belief that there's more than one God. So um, that it, there's a tension here because when we start talking about God in three persons, if, if you talk about modalism, that's easy, it's one God. He's just expressing himself differently. And so we really, that's an easy place to go, right? You can say, okay, it's one God. He just expresses himself differently. But if you start talking about God in three persons, wow, that sounds like three gods, doesn't it? Sounds like, not what it is. But it may sound like that. And there, so there's this tension that is created. In Deuteronomy 6.4, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, that's Elohainu, the Lord is one. In Malachi 2.10, it says, Don't we all have the same Father? Didn't one God create us all? So there is monotheism. The Scripture teaches one God. But then listen to this. Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. Most of you in here could create it. In the beginning, who created the heavens and the earth? What is the Hebrew name that is used there? Elohim, right? So Elohim, okay, so that's a great name. Um, in the Bible, if you're looking at angels, there's a, there's a thing called cherub. A cherub is a type of angel, right? But if you have more than one cherub, what do you have? Cherubim. Seraphs are another type of angel. So if you have one seraph, you have a seraph. If you have three seraphs, what do you have? Seraphim. When you put an I am behind a root word in the Hebrew, it turns it into plural. The word El means God. So when you put El, Ohim, what are you doing with the word? You're making it plural, are you not? And you say, well, Ron, nah, I think you're just kind of off. Okay, let's go down to verse 26, where he's getting ready to make Adam and Eve. And so what does he say? Let us make man in our image. If if God is a single person expressing himself differently, who's he talking to? The angels didn't make you. He couldn't have been talked to the angels. 
The angels had nothing to do with creation other than they did whatever he asked him to do, asked them to do. God was speaking. Elohim was speaking. Us was speaking. God in three persons. One God, three persons. Enemies of Christ will use that. Enemies of Christ will say, see, that's not one God. They will actually use it and say, well, I told you Jesus was not really God. God, Jesus was just a man. Not true. Um, can't be three different persons because that violates the one God. You see, the enemies of Christ will use that. So we have to study harder. Let's go back and revisit what Dr. Harrell's definition was. The one true God eternally exists as three persons. One in essence, equal in glory, and distinct in relations. Our primary scripture when I started this morning was Jesus coming up out of the river. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. The New Testament, this place in the New Testament probably gives the most succinct picture of the Trinity that I guess can be seen. Um, this is not God expressing himself in three different ways that, at the same time. Remember, Jesus in bodily form, the dove in bodily form, and the voice from heaven at the same time. What does it mean to be one in essence? It means this, the Father possesses all that makes God who he is. The Son possesses all that God makes God who he is. The Spirit possesses all that makes God who he is. They're not all like one-third God. They are all completely God. They are one in essence. They are equal in glory. I'm going to talk a little bit about that glory. They are all unbegotten. That means nobody created them. Jesus was known as God's only begotten son, remember, in John 3, 16. But that's the incarnate Jesus. The, the second person of the Trinity, the Son of who is the second person in the Trinity, what does it say about him in John 1? In the beginning was what? And, and the Word was what? And the Word was what? Was God. And he was with God from the beginning. And then down in verse 14, it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among men. God the Son, pre-incarnate, was unbegotten. Nobody created Him. He was with God from the beginning, and He was God from the beginning. He has all the, remember, one in essence. He had everything that makes Him God, Jesus has. Everything that makes Him God, the Spirit has. Everything that makes Him God, the Father has. They're not one-third making up a whole, two, three one-thirds make a whole. All right, that's great math if you're going to school. It's not good theology. Another aspect of his glory is he's El Shaddai. He is God Almighty. Listen to what God, this is great. In Exodus, um, God spoke to Moses and he said to him, I am Adonai. Now, I'm going to use, um, Rich knows this. I, I, I often use the complete Jewish Bible for my Bible references, because I want to know when it talks about God. You know, it says Lord and God, and it uses, and it, it may be using four or five different names. I want to know what name he's using, because God reveals himself in his names, does he not? He's saying to Moses, I am Adonai, the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as El Shaddai, God Almighty. Although I did not 
make myself known to them by my name, Jehovah or Yahweh, which means I am that I am. Do you hear it? God's saying, that, that's just awesome to me. He's saying to Moses, so listen, I, I revealed myself. I'm the Lord. I'm speaking to you. And I revealed myself to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty. But I didn't tell them my secret name that I just told you. I am that I am. He is almighty. He is eternal. I, we just referenced John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. God the Word was with Him from the beginning. John 8 says, Abraham, your father was glad, and Jesus is speaking here, Abraham, your father was glad that he would see my day. Then he saw it and was overjoyed. Now you imagine he's telling the Pharisees this, uh, Abraham was looking forward to when I got here. And now he saw it and he was overjoyed. What? Why? And they're saying, you're not even 50 years old yet. You've seen Abraham? And Yeshua said to them, yes, indeed. Before Abraham, Yahweh, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. That's, he's eternal. He's incomprehensible, yet knowable. Now that sounds like a conflict, doesn't it? Something's totally incomprehensible, yet at the same time that it's knowable. Psalm 145.3 says, Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and His greatness is unsearchable. Why bother? Is that what it's like? Okay. Isaiah 55, remember we just read 5 and 6, said, seek the Lord while he may be found. In verse 8 it says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts your thoughts. This sounds like, why are we even in the study? There's no way to know this. Well, here's why. Peter says this in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. May grace be and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has granted to all things that pertain to life and godliness through knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. God has revealed himself to us. He did that because that was his design for the. That didn't say, he didn't sit around thinking one day, you know what? I think I'm going to show myself to them. I think I'll do that. I, I got a new idea. Hey, um, son, come over here. I want to tell you something. I got another idea. No, from the beginning, God had a plan to reveal himself to us. And his son, the second part of the Trinity, was a part of that from the beginning. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the word was God from the beginning. That brings us to majestic. Part of his glory is the, he's majestic. We've sung this song. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Right? That's where it comes from. Psalm 8. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens out of the mouth of babies and infants. You have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens and the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen and beasts of the fields, the bird of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. Listen, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. He is majestic. God is one in essence, equal in glory. Each person of the Trinity has all of those aspects of glory about them. But then he is distinct in relations.
his relationship with the, the, the Father, the Son, the Spirit, they have a relationship with one another. And those relationships are distinct. And one of the distinctions that's made with them is submission. The Son submits to the Father. Remember what he told his people? He said, I, I didn't come to do my will. I came to do the will of my father. And another place he said, everything I do, I do because the Lord has sent me to do it. He is submitted to the father. We see the Holy Spirit. What is the Holy Spirit doing? Look at me, look at me. Is that what the Holy Spirit does? No, the Holy Spirit says, look at the son. Look at the son. He died for you. He loves you. The Father loves you. Look at him. Come. Come to me. The, ho the Holy Spirit is the one that draws you. You see, unless God draw you, you can't even come to God. Who brought, draws you? The Spirit. And what, how does he draw you? He says, he says look at the Son. He, he brings all glory to the Son. And as Paul said, I boast of nothing save Christ. And what? Him? Crucified. That's what the Spirit does. <clears throat> the picture of willful, loving submission is a picture for us. It's a model for us to follow. Children are called to submit and obey their parents, are they not? Wives are instructed to submit to their husbands. Members of the body are admonished to submit to the elders. Citizens are called to submit to their government authorities. We all are called in Ephesians chapter 5 to submit to one another. And the elders are called to submit to one another as well as to Christ, who is the head of of the church. Jesus, the, the Son, the second person in the Trinity, does not submit to the Father because the Father says, submit. He doesn't have to command the Son to do that. The, the Son submits. It's a part of love. And you are not, I'm supposed to submit to my fellow elders, and I'm supposed to submit actually to you as part of the body. I'm not to do that because God says, you got to do that. I need to do that because I love. And, and I want to honor what the Father does. I, I look at the, the relationship. Remember, he says, let us create them in our image. What does our image look like? Well, one part of the image was there was submission. The, uh, the Spirit submits to the, to the Son in the sense that He brings glory and points constantly to the Son. And the Son brings glory to the Father out of submitting. He prayed even in Gethsemane. He said, Father, not my will, but your will be done. Even though this is not really what I want to do right now, I still say, I love you and I submit to you. The woman was made from Adam's rib. Genetically exact. Exact same. There was no. Listen, it was made from his rib. It was all his DNA, right? God didn't say. God now, God made man from the dust of the earth. But he made woman from the rib of man. She was genetically the exact same. And, and according to Galatians 3, there is no female or male. There's no slave or free. There's no, no, no Greek or Jew. We are all equal. At the foot of that cross, it's all level ground. It's not, well, the men are up here and the women are down. That's not the way it is. Women get saved the exact same way that a man gets saved. And they are gifted with spiritual gifts the same as a man is. But, according to the word, they are asked to submit to their husband. That is a picture. 
of how God made them. He said, let us make man in our own image. Man and woman, he created them. Sin of pride, whether it be in marriage or whether it be in relationships where I refuse to submit myself. We were talking about some pastors who have fallen. We talked about this morning. We weren't trying to make fun. We were actually very sad talking about it. But there are pastors and people of God who have fallen. Most of the time it's over pride. And by the way, they won't. It, listen, I've fallen. Anybody in here that hasn't fallen, you go ahead and kick the first stone, okay? I'm good with that. But those that fall need to find their safe faces right there at the foot of the cross because you're broken. You've been forgiven. You don't stay fallen and stay prideful about your fallenness, right? You don't say, well, hey, I'm forgiven, so I'm good to go. I'm still going to keep on my old path, whatever it is that I'm doing. No, 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 that's not what it... Listen, we all fall. We break. We're, we still live in this flesh, and we goof up. But we have a Savior, it says, who sits at the right hand of the Father, who ever intercedes for us. But what does he say? Listen, confess your sins. And if you, are, if you will confess your sins, he says that he is faithful and righteous to forgive you of all your sins and all unrighteousness. That's if you confess, you've got to be broken and, and at the foot of the cross. The sin of pride gets into the way, doesn't it? I, I, don't, I, don't, want to, I don't want to tell Bob I've been thinking whatever I've been thinking. Stinking thinking. I, I don't want to tell my wife how I've you know, I thought things I shouldn't think. So I just pridefully get up here and I'm good to go. No. I'm forgiven. That's all I can say to you is I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven because I have a merciful God. And he knows what I went through. He says he knows every temptation. I've, he's dealt with it himself. And as a result, he can look at me and say, son, I got you. I've got you. You're right. You're wrong. We got it. I'm washing your feet. Now get up, son, and go to work and go. Don't do it again. Just like he told the woman who fell at his feet. He said, listen, who condemns you? Uh, they've all gone. He's, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Don't do that anymore. Don't do it. And then there's delegation. Remember, he's distinct in relations. There's submission, and then there's delegation. God the Father is supreme. We'll talk about him next week. He delegates to the Son. What does is, what is he do? Son, I want you to go. And I want you to die. I want you to redeem them. I want you to buy this people back. Spirit, I want you to go, and I want you, every believer, everyone who believes in the Son, I want you to indwell Him. You are my pledge to them that I got them. You are my pledge that says this, I will complete the work that I began in you. God delegates and when you delegate, you don't just delegate responsibility. You delegate the authority. Jesus says, I've been given all authority in heaven and in earth. Now, who's, if he was given it to him, who did he get it given to by? God the Father. The Father delegated all authority in heaven and earth to the Son. Not jealously, right? As a matter of fact, what he said, listen... I'm going to make your enemies your footstool. Ah, I got you, son. He delegates. The son submits. And the Holy Spirit lovingly points to the Savior. The Trinity. It's not one person acting three different ways. It's the three persons of the one God. 
who have different roles and they have different relationships, yet they are one in essence. Everything that makes them God, each one of them holds completely. And they are equal in glory. Whatever is said of the Father is also true of the Son in terms of being unbegotten, eternal, um, almighty. All of those things that I shared with you. We have an awesome God. And here's the deal. He says, call to me. And I'm going to show you things that you are just, you would never believe. You'll never believe the things that I'm going to show you if you just call to me and ask me. What kind of God, what other religion can you think of that is in, on this earth at the present time, can you think of that has a God like that who says, you just call on me and I'm going to come to you. It's a, if you'll knock out or if you'll answer, I'll come in and we'll eat together. We will live life together. And I'll be with you till the end of the age. I promise you that even though death comes to your door, I'll still be with you. I'll take you home. You're going to be with me for eternity. Don't you want to know a little more about me today? You're going to be with me forever. Come and see me today. Come and join me today. I think that's what God is telling us. And the Trinity is such a beautiful, beautiful picture. A reality. It's not just a picture that's painted. It's a reality. But it's one that God has painted for us so that we can see it and we can explore it and we can ask him about it and we can go to him with it and we can write songs about it and enjoy him for eternity. Let's pray, and then I think Cameron's got another song for us, right? Oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. How amazing that you would be mindful of man. Dust of the earth until you breathe and lost life into his nostrils. Yet, you hold us dearly. Not because you need to. Not because you're obligated. Simply because you choose to love us. Even when we rebelled, it says this, that even while we were sinners, Christ died for us. What love. We don't deserve it. We have, certainly haven't earned it, Lord. But we do receive it with gratitude, with thanksgiving, with praise. Let us not just keep it to ourselves, but let us tell the nation. Let us tell the world about that love. That we would be working in conjunction with the Holy Spirit as he points to Jesus on the cross. That we too are like Andrew saying, come and see, come and see. Come and see the Messiah. I pray that you would do these things, Lord God, for your glory, for our benefit. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.